And that means supporting local manufacturing and taking steps to capture value at every step in the production chain. It will include dedicating a portion of the allowable annual cut to high value producers who are creating jobs right here in BC. And as I've said, British Columbians feel deeply connected to their forests and want to see a forward looking approach. They have shared their ideas on how forestry can support resilient communities, enable reconciliation, and provide the sustainable products the world will buy. They also want to ensure we are upholding our responsibility to the environment and prioritizing biodiversity and ecosystem health. Our vision is guided by what we have heard through past conversations, like the Interior Forest Sector Renewal Initiative and the Coast Forest Sector Revitalization. And I just want to take this time to acknowledge the work of our previous minister, Deputy Minister, John Allen, and my former colleague, former Minister, Doug Donaldson, both who helped us to ensure we got started on the right path to moving forward. This plan is, is interwoven with our commitment to doing things differently, to protect vital old growth stands while supporting workers and communities for generations to come. It builds on the pro progress we've made protecting those over 200,000 hectares of old growth by committing to defer logging in even more areas in BC. We recognize the need for further changes and, and work is underway to identify areas of the province where we could make additional deferrals to protect areas that are at risk of irreversible loss. Responsibly managed forests are a legacy for future generations and we are acting to address challenges of today but also so our children and grandchildren can experience the benefits and opportunities that our forests provide. Now, I would like to welcome some of our speakers here today. And first, I want to welcome Chief John French from the Takla Nation to share some comments with us. Welcome, Chief John. He's on mute. Chief, you're on mute. <laughs> so that's always a first. <laughs> Hello, can you hear me? Excellent. <laughs> Get that right one day yet. Chief John French from the Takla First Nation. Um, my hereditary name is Gula Han. I've been asked to speak here on behalf of the Carrier Second First Nations. First, I'd like to start by thanking Premier Horgan and Minister Conroy for inviting me to speak today about the intentions paper and that beautiful vision that you shared. I would also like to congratulate your government on the positive steps that you are taking to put reconciliation into action. Your government enacted the Declaration of Right of Indigenous Peoples Act is a major step in our shared reconciliation journey. A few weeks ago, Minister Conroy announced an apportionment decision in the Prince George timber supply area that apportioned approximately 1.24 million cubic meters to First Nations tenures. This is the largest percentage of an annual allowable cut that the ministers has apportioned to First Nations in the history of British Columbia. Representing yet another precedent forge through collaboration between the Carrier Second First Nations and the province. Continuing to put reconciliation in action in the forest sector means several things to the First Nations, including enhancing, enhancing our stewardship outcomes for First Nations, ensuring that the use of our resource benefits us as First Nations people economically, spiritually, and otherwise. Ensuring that the use of our resource Ensuring that we are active decision makers in managing our forests. The intentions paper is an important step in ensuring that we as First Nations people take a rightful place as partners and regulators of the forest sector. We welcome the opportunity to co-develop tools that will provide us with greater access to tenure in our territories. As true partners, we need to have access to tenure volume equivalent to 50% of what our territories contribute to the forest sector. 
equal revenue sharing with the province, joint decision-making on key statutory decisions. The province's ability to deliver on, the, on its commitments to co-develop these tools with First Nations will be import, the important yardstick in measuring the province commitment to implement DRIPA. These changes are long overdue and will provide the certainty to all participants in the fourth sector in British Columbia, that British Columbians are seeking. Must say, thank you. Thank you so much, Chief. And, and I have to tell you, it was a real honor to be, a, uh, to be able to talk to uh, the carriers of candy nations about that apportionment decision and was glad that we could make it and I know it's gonna it's the right decision for moving forward to for the in industry for many years to come and now I'm really pleased to introduce uh, John Brink from Brink Forest Products in Northern BC it's really great to have you here today John thanks Thank you very much, uh, Minister and uh, Premier, for inviting me. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm speaking from the territory of the Clayton Aetane and Prince George. It is a privilege to be able to speak today about the future of the industry in our province. I've been working in this industry for close to 50 years. I started as a teenager working in my dad's lumber mill in Holland. At the age of 24, I came to Canada I spoke barely a word of English at $25.47 in my pocket when I arrived in BC. The only thing I did have was, uh, the only thing that I did have was a dream to build a lumber mill as far back as I can remember. I've always had a passion for the forest industry. More than 50 years later, I look back to, with pride to what I have accomplished through hard work, building Brain Forest Products was certainly not an overnight task. A long way, in fact, had, a, had many in, of everything from a sawmill to value-added manufacturing. I've seen how the sector can help build communities like my hometown of Prince George. I've been an advocate of uh, the industry for many years with Kofi and the Council of uh, Value-Added Wood Processors. I feel like I know the industry inside out, but I also know it's my work is not done. My dream, my dream uh, is to see British Columbia's entire forest industry survive and not just survive. I want to see BC's forest industry prosper and to be competitive globally. My vision for the industry that provides not only economic value, but also social value. To do that, the industry won't look anything like what it does today. I will be, it will be an industry with more secondary manufacturing of our forest resources. My vision is to see an innovative primary sector in combination with the secondary sector. It's not just about the building products, it's about building local economies. By making more than dimension lumber, we can radically increase forward related jobs in British Columbia. And we can increase our social capital, creating more su supporting opportunities, our communities and our companies, large and small, and seeing an increased indigenous involvement in the sector. This will take a new industrial strategy. We'll need to be firmly anchored in our strength and utilization of opportunities available to us in the global marketplace. We'll take investment in the workforce and training people for the new jobs and new products we create. This is a defining moment for government, NBC, and the forest industry have, have to, uh, to, I believe we have the policy intention government paper has laid out uh, today has a huge step in that direction. Thank you, Premier Horrigan, for the opportunity and Minister Conroy for having the vision. I look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you so much, John, and, and uh, I just really want to thank you for your passion and, and for your vision of the forest industry. And if anybody has 
uh, would like to hear more about it, they only need to pick up the book that he's recently written about his story. I have to tell you, my I got a copy, he gave me a copy for my 92-year-old father who's an immigrant from Denmark, and not only did he read it once, John, he's read it twice because it's fascinating, he said, and he just loves the story, and it's a great story, and it shows that, that commitment to British Columbia that you have, so thank you for your passion. And last but definitely not least, uh, I want to welcome uh, Jeff Bromley, the chair of the United Steelworkers um, Wood Council, who's joining us, I believe, from the East Kootenays today. So thank you so much for joining us, Jeff. I am, Minister, and thank you. And thank you to uh, Premier Horgan and, and Minister Conroy. Uh, and yes, I am uh, calling in or, or zooming in, I guess as the word is, from the traditional territory of the Tanaka speaking and unceded territory of the Tanaka speaking uh, People here in Cranbrook, in the East Kootenay, a little bit just over the hump from uh, your neck of the woods, uh, Minister, uh, over there in Castlegar. Um, I, I am honored to be uh, joined uh, by the uh, distinguished guests and to also uh, be a part of this uh, historic announcement in terms of this intention paper on the renewal of, of our forest industry. Um, as you may or may not know, uh, the Steelworkers represents uh, over 16,000 woodworkers from across the country. But here in British Columbia, we, we represent 12,000 woodworkers and workers that make their living off the forest industry in BC, whether you be in manufacturing, whether you're being in secondary manufacturing or in, in harvesting, and especially on the coast where many of our workers make their living. I am a uh, third generation forest worker. I, I come out of a, an operation, a camphor operation, about 45 minutes east of here in Elko. Um, I am a third generation uh, uh, forestry worker. Uh, my son, who's a uh, Virginia college student, college student, my youngest son, he uh, just finished his first stint uh, working these uh, paper excellence scoop and chuck shutdown to save for uh, university uh, at UBCO in uh, the Okanagan in September. So uh, I, I can speak pretty personally how important the forest industry is to uh, not only my family and, and, and the fact that it's put uh, food on the table and a, a roof over my head for uh, the better part of 27 years that I've been in the industry, but how important it is to uh, all of our members and those 50,000 workers that uh, Premier Horgan mentioned off the top who make their livelihood from good paying union jobs for the most part um, that uh, support uh, our communities, uh, mostly rural communities for the most part that uh, are situated outside uh, either Victoria or the lower mainland. Uh, so, I, I mean, the intentions paper is certainly uh, the next step in, in, in forestry policy. And I think that the, our government's uh, direction in terms of engaging with First Nations and the, the implementation of UNDRIP is the important next first step. And how important are forest, uh, forest, forests on the traditional territories of our First Nations across this province is important to the, the, those peoples and, and the support of those nations, those various nations who stand to certainly benefit from an improved relationship and a, and a bigger uh, say in, in what happens within our forest industry. Uh, however, I'm, I'm certainly uh, cautious, uh, I guess, in terms of what the impact will be. I'm always cautious and in, uh, in terms of as long as the impact that uh, we don't want the impact to be on our good paying jobs. And, and I don't think that that's going to be the case. And we want the impact of any review of old growth to be certainly based on the science and not on the emotion and, and, and based on uh, on nation-to-nation -nation discussions, having all partners, whether it be industry, First Nations, labor, communities, all at the table, and certainly having a part of that decision-making process about how any uh, revisions will impact those uh, particular entities. So um, I, I do, again, commend the government on this uh, transformation uh, of, the, of the, uh, uh, the, the intentions paper and the direction that for, for the forest policy would take, will take. And it's my hope that we can grow jobs and, and I can certainly we can create more well-paying union jobs out there for our members. And so um, I look forward to uh, working with the government, working with these with our partners here and, and growing that, those ideals. So thanks very much for having me. Thank you so much, Jeff, and, and thank you for representing the, you know, the, the members of, of uh, the workers that are, are part of, this, of your union, but also all the, the workers in this industry right across the province. Of over, as the Premier said, over 50,000 people that work in the industry, and it's, it's important to have the workers' voice here as well. So thank you to all three of you for sharing your vision, your support, and, and uh, ensuring that uh, you're here to, um, to, 
to be with us as we start this journey in, in modernizing the, the forest industry. And, and I want to thank everyone who joined us today. And, and I'm actually really excited and, and quite honoured uh, to be the minister who's moving this forward, to moving BC forward to um, in a new way of, of uh, running our forest industry. And right now I'd like to invite uh, Premier Horgan back to the podium and, and we're happy to take questions. Thanks, uh, Mr. Conroy, and, and thanks to uh, Chief French, to John Brink, and to Jeff Bromley for participating with us here today. Thank you. As a reminder to everybody on the phone line, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You will be limited to one question and one follow-up. First question today is from Justine Hunter, Globe and Mail. Thank you. Uh, Premier, um, I know you signaled that this was coming in your last Kofi speech, but essentially you have five big tenure holders here in BC. Wondering if they should be looking at this as these changes as a kind of a step towards breaking up what is a bit of a monopoly. Uh, well, certainly you're, you're correct, uh, Justine. Um, it wasn't just at the last Kofi speech. Uh, the first Kofi speech I made as Premier made it clear I thought to the industry, whether they be uh, value-added manufacturers like John Brink or the major uh, uh, companies like Canfor, Interfor, West Fraser and others, uh, that we needed to change how forestry took place in British Columbia. In 2017, we were focused on making sure that we ensured that forestry represented the values of the people of this great province and reminding all of you that uh, the trees uh, on public lands, the forests on public lands belong to the people of BC, they belong to the indigenous communities uh, where they're growing. And uh, the tenure system has been developed and evolved over, uh, over decades and is meet not meeting the needs of communities, it's not meeting the needs of workers, and quite frankly, it's not meeting the needs of other players in the sector who want access to more fiber, to create more jobs, more value-added products. And I made it pretty clear at that, that time and at successive speeches since then that we can't keep doing what we're doing. We need to find a different way to create wealth, create jobs, and sustain the industry uh, through climate change. We've seen unprecedented fires. We've seen uh, unprecedented beetle and, and spruce budworm infestations in our forests, and that's going to continue. So in a climate change environment, we can't continue to just cut forests and assume that everything's going to be fine thereafter. I don't think anyone in the industry is surprised by where we are. We've been foreshadowing this for some time. We've been consulting for some time, and I believe the way forward is now upon us, and I'm very excited about that. Justine, do you have a follow-up? Yeah, thank you. Um, political leaders have been talking about the need to get higher value secondary manufacturing here in BC for decades, at least that I can recall. What is in this that is going to get Canfor or West Fraser or these other big companies to invest in that now? Well, we're already looking at uh, exciting opportunities like mass timber, cross-laminated timber, as adding value to what would have been in many instances waste wood, taking that that would have gone into a pile and creating value and wealth from it. Uh, the industry is adapting. Companies in the West Kootenai, uh, Kalashnikov, for example, was all about volume until they discovered that there's more uh, wealth to be created, more jobs to be created, more long-term future in adding value. John Brink's whole story is about adding more value. So for the major tenure holders, they understand where we're going and we've been talking about this for some time. We need to distribute the available forest products to the people in communities. Uh, Chief French spoke about the largest apportionment in history just a few weeks ago and that apportionment was not punitive. It wasn't meant to punish anyone. It was meant to better reflect the ownership and the values in our forests to better reflect what the future needs to look like. Next question is from Richard Zussman, Global News. Uh, Premier, we're expecting Dr. Henry to announce on Thursday that uh, British Columbians can mix and match uh, vaccines if they received AstraZeneca as a first shot. Uh, you received AstraZeneca. Have you given thought yet to what vaccine you are going to receive as your second dose? Uh, I have uh, I have been thinking about that recently, to be sure. Uh, I've not yet been eight weeks since my uh, first dose. Uh, Dr. Henry has been foreshadowing in our uh, briefing sessions that uh, change is coming in terms of how uh, we're going to deal with second doses here in British Columbia. 
Uh, I, I feel at this point in time, I'm going to stick with uh, what had me getting AstraZeneca at the time. The first available vaccine for me is going to be the best available vaccine. And I suggest to all British Columbians, they should adopt that policy as well. Uh, the evidence is pretty clear. Dr. Henry will lay that out in more detail than I could possibly do. Uh, but I, uh, I'm comfortable that if AstraZeneca is the first uh, second dose offered to me, that's what I'll take. If it's Pfizer, that's what I'll take. If it's Moderna, that's what I'll take. Richard, do you have a follow-up? I do. The Greater Vancouver Board of Trade is expressing concern that there isn't a plan yet from Ottawa around timelines for opening up uh, the international borders. Are you putting any pressure on Ottawa to create, like we have in BC in terms of a restart plan, a multi-step plan for reopening borders? And are you worried that delaying this could mean that conventions or concerts or big meetings that plan way in advance will go to the United States or other countries uh, over British Columbia? Uh, well, that's certainly a consideration, but there are a whole host of other considerations. And we have been engaged with the federal government from the beginning of the pandemic. I think uh, the Prime Minister said at our last gathering last week, it's the 32nd time uh, that premiers and the prime minister and his team have got together to talk about these issues, unprecedented in our history. And I believe it's developed relationships across uh, party lines, across regional differences, uh, to put us all squarely where I think Canadians want us to be, making the best decisions possible for everybody. Uh, we were among the first to say we needed to close our borders to protect British Columbians. The federal government responded. Uh, we've been working uh, casually and, and behind the scenes with other provinces to look at how a restart uh, of our borders would look. And I give full credit to the Prime Minister and his team for not imposing upon uh, provinces uh, a view on how we should do that. Quite the contrary, they've been seeking advice and input from all of us from coast to coast to coast about how best for all of us to come back and welcome the world to Canada. And I think that's the appropriate way forward. There are concerns, of course, by waiting, but I think there are an equal number of people who are, are very grateful that we're going to wait and see what uh, immunization rates are like in the U.S. and in other jurisdictions around the world before we welcome the world back to British Columbia or to Canada. Next question is from Binder Sajjan, CTV. Uh, you referenced uh, Kamloops and the discovery there, and I'm just wondering um, in terms of next steps, um, can you tell us what they are in terms of your government and if uh, you've extended an offer of services or funding uh, to the communities impacted? Uh, today, uh, I had another conversation. We've been reaching out to, to Kamloops and Shwetma leadership. Uh, Kushbi uh, Kazmir uh, and I spoke today, and I made it abundantly clear that we stand ready to assist uh, the nation and, in fact, Indigenous peoples across the province in meeting the challenges of dealing with this horrific discovery. Uh, I believe that's the appropriate way forward. Uh, the chief was grateful for the call, was grateful for the offer of help but more importantly, uh, understands that the burden uh, that is on her shoulders and her community's shoulders as a result of the revelations are not just felt here in British Columbia, but indeed around the country and across the world. Uh, this is a reminder to all Canadians that uh, the residential school issues were not just a story in our past, it exists today as a profound issue in Indigenous communities for survivors, for children of survivors. I spoke with Chief Harvey McLeod from the Upper Nicola Band, who was a residential school survivor, and he told me quite graphically how he felt on Friday when he got the news from uh, Tekemlips and Shwetmuk territory about the findings at the old school site. And, and you can't help be mo but be moved when you hear from a survivor about the impacts of reliving those experiences. So uh, it's not for us to uh, give direction. It's for us to be there to assist the nations when they ask for it. That's our commitment and we'll stick with that. Follow up, Bender? Yes, and there have been calls um, saying that all of the residential schools in BC may have unmarked graves um, and it's time to locate the remains. If the federal government doesn't step up, is BC willing to pitch in some funding to make that happen? I spoke with uh, my colleague Doug Routley, the member for Nanaimo North Cowichan, who represents uh, Cooper Island, where the closest residential school to Victoria. 
And uh, he told me, as I was, I was aware, that the community has been talking about the challenges of residential schools, the, the undocumented disappearances of children over the decades. Uh, this is not just an issue in Kamloops, it's not just an issue on Cooper Island, it's an issue across the province. And, and I will be in Lower Post uh, on uh, National Indigenous Day uh, with the Cascadene, with the Taltan, and with the Clacka River Tingit, Klingit to take down the last vestiges of the residential school there. And I believe the province has an obligation to work to it, it make sure that the 94 calls to action are realized. I know the Prime Minister is recommitted to that. And I think if there's anything positive to come out of the revelations from Kamloops, it is a reminder to Canadians that this work is not yet done and there's more to do. And I stand ready to help Indigenous leadership do that work. Rob Shaw, Czech News. Oh, hi, uh, Premier. Apologies uh, if this is a repeat question to get cut off at the beginning, but um, the protesters at Ferry Creek right now who are looking at this forestry paper today, hoping that it charted some type of path to preserve those old growth trees and solve that conflict that's going on in your riding, are undoubtedly disappointed looking at this um, and seeing kind of a path for more consultation than a new old growth plan by 2023. What do you have to say to them? Uh, who continue to be arrested in your riding, uh, protesting your government's um, forestry policies. Well, I certainly understand the passion for ancient trees and old growth forests. I grew up here on Vancouver Island in ancient forests, and I appreciate that passion. I share that passion. And we started as a government in 2017, putting in place uh, a uh, the two commissioners, Al Gorley and Gary Merkel, to do an independent review of the state of play of old growth in British Columbia. It was an exhaustive report. It was lauded by everyone when it was tabled. And after reviewing the information that was presented to government, we committed to implementing all 14 recommendations. As I said, and Minister Conroy confirmed, we started by deferring 200,000 hectares of old growth forest. We made sure that the old growth registry was robust to protect not just old ancient trees, but also the groves where they grow. This is critically important to biodiversity, critically important to species at risk. But implementing all of the recommendations means that we have to implement all of the recommendations. And the critical recommendation that's at play at Ferry Creek is consulting with the title holders, the people whose land these forests are growing on. And that, in this instance, is the Pachidat. And further into uh, TFL 46 and TFL 44, the Dididat and the Huayat. And those consultations have to take place. If we were to arbitrarily put deferrals in place there, that would be a return to the colonialism that we have so graphically been brought back to as a result of issues in Kamloops this week. I'm not prepared to do that. And I think most British Columbians understand that we need to preserve these forests. We need to do it in a way that's mindful of the title holders, the, tr the traditional territories of the indigenous peoples who have been there for millennia. And we have to build out a plan that is has buy-in from everybody. That's the only way this will hold from government to government to government is if we make it, uh, the, do it the right way at the front end. And that's what we've been doing and we're gonna keep doing that. There'll be more uh, discussions about tables that are being uh, developed as a result of the uh, issues around Ferry Creek. And that'll be happening in the days and weeks ahead. I'm confident we're on the right track and I understand the passions that people have here, I really do. Uh, but I believe that we need to do this in the right way. And that means engaging with First Nations. And that's our highest priority as we implement all 14 of the recommendations of Gourlay and, and Merkel. Follow up, Rob. Sure, thanks. Uh, in a, a larger sense for the forestry industry, you know, we've heard over the years that sometimes it's the larger companies that can better weather the ups and downs of the market, the softwood lumber dispute, the, uh, the sort of changes in the instability. But they also require some type of stability on their tenures to make investments in their mills and their facilities. And I'm just wondering if, is there a worry that these changes um, destabilize in some way uh, the forestry sector or the investment that's here by kind of adding a question mark over the stability of tenures that some companies might count on to make investments? Well, I've been looking at investments that are being made by many of the majors uh, over the past number of years, and they have not been in British Columbia. 
they've been in other jurisdictions. The wealth that's been created here has been mobile and has moved into other places. That doesn't mean we give up. That means we look at the tenure system. We look at those who want access to fiber to create wealth and create jobs. We make sure that we uh, look to First Nations first and foremost as we build out a new modern forest policy and a new modern forest industry. And we very much want the major players to continue to participate, but they have to understand that the, the old chasing volume is no longer viable in a time of climate change. We have had unprecedented fire seasons, as you know full well. We have had infestations in our woods that have meant that our forests have been disappearing, not because of, uh, of uh, harvesting, but because of other, uh, other natural disasters that are a result of climate change. So all of us need to look at this differently. There have been discussions around tenure reform for decades. Now is the time to make those steps forward. When we see record high uh, lumber prices, this is the time to make sure that everybody benefits from that. Most importantly, we make sure British Columbians benefit from that. Next question is from Tom Fletcher, Black Press. Uh, hi, Premier. A uh, couple of questions. Maybe the minister uh, would uh, be able to uh, uh, deal with here. You're kicking me um, off, Tom? Uh, uh, well, uh, no, you can, you can take a shot. Please no, take I'll, a shot. I'll let uh, the minister. Uh, Go ahead. The, uh, the recent Prince George apportionment, uh, that represented uh, about four times uh, more of a share for Carrier Sakani communities. Uh, I'll guess that's on a smaller base. Um, did that require significant buybacks from tenure holders in that district? Um, that's a, d a decision that was made over a number of years and uh, we are looking at uh, how we are going to be uh, working with all of the uh, the tenure holders and uh, had considerable input from the tenure holders. Um, the tenure holders in, in apportionment, uh, there's not a, a buyback situation, but uh, I know that the tenure holders are looking at the carrier Sakani and, and working in partnership with them. They've already reached out to them and, and I, I think it, this is a, a, a good move, a, a positive move for the forest industry and in moving forward and ensuring that uh, Indigenous nations have um, some control of, of the forest tenure that, that is in their traditional territory. Follow up, Tom? Uh, yeah, I, um, I guess that means that those were expired. Uh, okay. Um, the the tenure transfer from Canfor uh, to Interfor with the Vaven B note closure, uh, the province uh, provided two and a half million dollars to the Simqua First Nation to buy a share of that. Um, is that a, an indication of the kind of uh, transfer costs going forward? Are we going to see more of those? So that was before my time. That was done by Minister Donaldson. And I think the, the Premier would love to get in on this one. <laughs> I know he would. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Tom, that was uh, in the previous government. It was uh, a challenging uh, uh, take back uh, and we worked closely with the tenure holder uh, with Canfor and with uh, Interfor to make that happen in, in concert with the Indigenous Nation. And I think that was, although it was difficult and hard negotiations, it was a template for where we're going when it comes to compensatory uh, take backs. This is not about uh, uh, doing harm. It's about doing the best we can in a changing and evolving forest environment. I think, again, that's the expectation the public has of us. We need to look beyond the tenure holders to look to the interests of the people of British Columbia. And I think that when we align those issues, when we, when we see the tenure holders, we see the remanufacturing companies, we see Indigenous nations and workers all coming together to benefit communities, then we're winning. The triple word score, as people keep saying, uh, referring to the great game of Scrabble. If we can find a way for everybody to win, then we're on the right track. I believe the intentions paper will do that. I know in my discussions with Kofi over the past number of years, we have solid partners there, but we also have solid partners who understand that the world is changing, whether it be the protracted discussions around softwood lumber, whether it be the impact of climate change, as I've said repeatedly, because we have to say that repeatedly, climate change is not going away. We need to address that on the land base, making sure that our forest policies reflect the new reality that we're all living in. And tenure holders understand that as well as anybody else. Next question is from Tanya Fletcher, CBC. 
Yeah, Premier, back to the pressure for an immediate uh, action plan stemming from the Ferry Creek conflicts. Uh, in the technical briefing, uh, reporters were told that conversations with several nations are underway, but they're confidential. What can you tell us about the status of those discussions or what kind of progress has been made? And in the meantime, what's your strategy? Are you planning to let the enforcement take its course uh, in the immediate future? Well, thank you for the question. And I, I have to say that uh, the, the government does not direct law enforcement. To, uh, a company sought an injunction, the courts granted that injunction, and then the courts uh, expect that their injunctions will be upheld by law enforcement. The government really has no direct role in that. And I appreciate people at home are saying, oh, come on, Horgan, how can that be so? Well, that's just the world that we live in. And I would suggest, as I have in the past as my time in this job, that I wouldn't want to live in a society where, po where politicians are directing law enforcement to do their bidding. That's not the world any of us want to live in. Now, having said that, the perception for the public is, is what it is. We don't want to see at the time of uh, gang violence where we want to to be deploying more law enforcement to address the challenges of criminals. It's very difficult to, uh, to watch law enforcement being utilized uh, to address the passions of people in old growth forests. But yet that's where we are. And I'm hopeful that in the days ahead, uh, when the tables are public uh, with the indigenous communities and others, uh, that we'll be able to uh, put, the, put the, uh, the pause in place that all of us, I think, so desperately want. I understand the passion of the people that are in the woods right now, but I also understand the importance of making sure that all of us understand that there needs to be give and take. The uh, recommendations in the old growth report were profound and we're committed to implementing them, but it's not the waving of a wand, it's hard work. And it involves not going back to our colonial past and dictating to indigenous communities what they can and cannot do in their territories. We were able to uh, put aside and defer 200,000 hectares, a massive amount, because that was the will of the indigenous territory, its people in the territories we were deferring. Uh, we have to work through that step by step. And it's not just Southern Vancouver Island, it's North Island, it's the interior of the island, it's on the coast. There's a lot of work to do. And we're not shying away from that work, but we're appealing to those who want faster action to work with us to get to a place where the broader community has an understanding of what we're trying to achieve here. Harmony and making sure that the value of our forests are there for generations to come. Tanya, do you have a follow up? Yes, please. Uh, further to Bindu's question, uh, the Assembly of First Nations National Chief Harry Belgard is calling on government uh, to commit to supporting First Nations seeking thorough investigations into former residential school sites and to take any and all action available to hold perpetrators accountable for their actions. As for what BC's role is in this, I mean, your minister yesterday said uh, the province stands ready to help any nation that wants it in regards to possibly repatriating remains. Are you waiting for leaders to reach out to you or are you taking an active role in seeking that out? Well, I, uh, and I, 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 I'm going to try and rephrase your question, Tanya, if I could, because we're not waiting, but it's appropriate that we do. Uh, obviously, we want to see action, the, the country wants to see action, but most importantly, Indigenous communities have to take this at their pace. And uh, I, I spoke with, uh, with Kushbi Kazmir today, uh, and uh, the burden that she is carrying, not just for her territory, but for the province and the country, is profound. And uh, I, I had told her, as Minister Rankin has done as well, that we stand ready to help when we can. And whatever decisions are, are reached here in British Columbia, and I have great respect for Grand Chief uh, Perry Belgard, and I, I take his advice uh, to heart, and I will reach out to him later in the day or tomorrow to talk about that. The province of British Columbia stands ready to implement all of the calls to action in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We put that not just in the, in the, in the uh, mandate letters of the Minister of Indigenous Relations, but every minister of government, because this is a cross-government approach, as is uh, our, our delivery of the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. This is not siloed. This is the future of British Columbia to make up for our past. And I think that we will be stronger as a result of that. And in the forest sector, if I could bring it back to the context of the attentions paper, this will provide more certainty for greater investments when smaller operators can see an opportunity to create wealth to tell the type of story that John Brink told about having a few bucks in your pocket coming to British Columbia and finding opportunity because there are partners that are willing to work with you uh, like the Carrier Sakani and others around British Columbia. This is the future and I'm excited about it and I think British Columbians are as well. 
We have time for one more question today. Franya Noor, the GOAT. For um, taking my question and thank you for the briefings. Uh, I apologize if this is a re repeat of anything. I kind of got dropped partway through. Um, this question is on oil growth um, and um, on bio biodiversity. I'm just wondering, I only saw it mentioned once and I stand corrected if it was more in the technical briefing and I'm wondering if uh, while you've re, both the minister and the premier have recommitted uh, to implementing all the recommendations, is the legislation going to be as strong as the recommendation in terms of a, um, protecting biodiversity and ecosystem health and um, making them legislative overarching priorities across the sectors? Thank you for the question and, and thank you for bringing us back because I, I think it's important to put the intentions paper with the uh, independent uh, review on old growth because they go together. Uh, one doesn't supersede the other. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to say that. We're committed to the 14 recommendations. We're committed to implementing them along with the intentions that we put forward today. And that will all come together in legislation in the, in the months ahead. And it will be done because of the thoughtful participation of so many people in making sure that the biodiversity and, and the important elements in our ancient forests are protected. I'm encouraged by uh, comments from the Federal Minister of Environment uh, about the federal government stepping up with significant resources to help us do the deferrals that we need to do to protect communities, to make sure that Indigenous partners understand, as they do full well on their own territory, the values that are at play. They're not just about harvesting. There's a whole host of other values that need to be represented and reflected. And I believe the intentions paper and the old growth report coming together lay out a pretty good plan for British Columbia that is not at all like our past. And that's what British Columbians expect. Friend, do you have a follow up? Yes, thank you. Um, just just uh, related to the deferrals, I know I've taken a few questions on it. I'm wondering, uh, in the technical briefing, uh, there was a response indicating that uh, the deferrals uh, would be decided in, in consultation with First Nations. Where's the uh, scientific community going to be fit into this? Like, there's certainly been some controversy about the deferral uh, areas that it were previously designated the 200,000 hectares that you referenced, Premier and um, Minister. So, you know, where 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 are scientists? What's what's their voice in this in, in determining the deferral areas? Well, many scientists work for government, uh, and that, or they come from academia, or they come from uh, industry, and it's that science that comes together from a variety of different places. And I, I, I know this sounds uh, a bit contrite, but there's not a place where scientists gather and give out good advice. They're connected to industry, they're connected to government, they're connected to universities, and they bring that information together, and we do the best we can to lay that over the decisions that we're making. All of this will be guided by the science, but not superseding uh, the rights and title of Indigenous peoples. I think that, uh, you know, I oftentimes talk about the hierarchy of values that we have as individuals in our families, in our communities. We have a whole bunch of things that we want to achieve in our life. Some of them, I, I'm not going to be playing in the NBA. I've given up on that dream, but I still like basketball. And so we've got to find ways to bring together the needs and wishes of people in communities across British Columbia to make sure that our forest policies reflect what British Columbians want to see, not just today, but in the future. And, and science is obviously fundamental to the work that we do. We have uh, legions of people that are engaging with government all the time. And I'll also say that as we know with science, there's disagreements on outcomes. And uh, that will be inevitable as well as disagreements among people about how fast or how slow to proceed. But at the end of the day, we all have to be at a table working together. That's what we're going to be doing in the days ahead with respect to the South Island. And I, I hope that we can continue to duplicate that as we engage with British Columbians, wherever they may be, whatever they may do, workers, uh, investors, Indigenous peoples, community leaders, so that we can see a return to where forests meant something to people in communities. I think of the town of Mackenzie. Uh, and uh, Chief French will know this full well, it's in his territory or just below his territory. 
Uh, there is truck after truck after truck of forests uh, that are moving through that town as they shutter their mill, shutter their pulp mill, because those jobs are no longer in that community. And we need to make sure that communities benefit from the work we do on the land. And we do that by adding value, by stepping away from high volume and focusing on the things that we can provide to the world, like mass timber, like a whole host of other products that create more wealth, create more jobs and benefit communities in the long term. That's our goal, that's our objective. And I'm confident we can get there if we provided, we work together and be patient with each other as we stumble forward and sometimes run a bit too fast for others. There's gotta be a balance and that's what we're striving for. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining us. Thanks everybody.